From bases like this one in East Anglia, on the east coast of England, came the many great American fighter planes that swarmed up into battle against the German Air Force in World War II. Fighters such as this one, a fast, tough, high-altitude fighter with a dive like its name and an eight-gun blast in its wing. Into these great fighters, America poured its genius, its millions of man-hours of labor, its faith in victory against the Luftwaffe. Into these fighters went the pilots who would set half the world free. These planes, these warbirds, came to rule the skies in World War II. This plane, flown in all theaters of the war, was one of the finest fighters in history. This plane was known as the P-47 Thunderbird. The P-47 Thunderbolt was originally designed for high-altitude interception, but was used effectively as both a ground attack aircraft and a bomber escort. Jokingly referred to as the seven-ton milk bottle, the P-47 had high speed, a strong frame, and an engine that wouldn't die. Some experts believe it to be the premier fighter of World War II. The P-51 has been virtually enshrined as America's finest fighter of the Second World War, and it deserves every accolade that it has received. But there was another very, very important airplane in our arsenal that we used in the European theater, and that was the P-47 Thunderbolt. In many ways, if you take a look at the force structure that was available to the Army Air Forces in the middle of the war, you find that the P-47 played a critical role in bringing the Luftwaffe into combat, destroying it in the air, and then, after June 1944 onwards, turning its attention as a swing roll fighter to air-to-ground attack. For example, the breakout across France, the, the operations of the 3rd Army against the Germans, the operations of the 12th Army Group under Bradley against the Germans, were immensely helped by P-47s operating basically as close air support and battlefield air interdiction strike aircraft. And that, that's a contribution of the P-47 for which it should justly be remembered. The P-47 had a 40-foot wingspan with a total length of just over 36 feet. Its height was 14 feet 7 inches. It was powered by one Pratt & Whitney R2800 engine and had a maximum speed of 426 miles per hour. It weighed 9,900 pounds empty and 14,000 pounds loaded for battle. With a ceiling of 40,000 feet and a range of 1,800 miles, it was fast and furious in the hands of a good pilot. The, the big uh, debate, of course, is uh, which aircraft was the finest American fighter World War II, the P-47 or the P-51. I think in terms of design elegance and design refinement, one would say the P-51. However, if one looks at the definition of a combat aircraft as a swing roll fighter, an airplane able to do multiple roles, multiple missions, my money would be in the P-47. It was a remarkably fine flying machine. It was extraordinarily tough. Uh, it literally could take an amazing amount of battle damage. In part, this was because it had a radial piston engine, a so-called corn cob engine. And because of that, it did not have the vulnerability that one would commonly associate with an inline cooled, a liquid cooled inline engine where you have a vulnerable radiator, vulnerable coolant lines, things of this sort, where a small hit can result in the complete destruction of an engine and the loss of an airplane. One of the real attributes that the P-47 had was its concentrated armament package. It had eight 50 caliber machine guns. When you take a look at the, the power of a 50 caliber round, in, in many ways, this round of course is a half inch round. It, uh, has almost the impact of a 20 millimeter cannon. And uh, the impact on the aircraft, or for that matter, mechanized transport, or things like that, uh, from the concentrated fire of, an of 850 calibers, 
uh, is devastatingly uh, effective. Uh, it just uh, basically uh, it does not allow the prey to escape. The prey will be at the very least badly damaged, and the aircraft will be very, very badly damaged if it takes a burst from 850 caliber machine guns. Uh, so this this enabled the P-47 to a very great degree to, in some cases, offset larger numerical uh, encounters with German fighters because a P-47 pilot getting a snapshot of an opponent would probably very easily destroy that airplane with a burst of fire, whereas the opponent may not be able to do the same to the P-47. If you take a look at German fighters, one thing that interests me, uh, looking at German fighter development as opposed to American, is that Germany was so besieged by strategic bomber attack in the Second World War, both the British at night and the Americans by day, that increasingly they put larger and heavier and more powerful cannon on their aircraft. You went from the, the 20 millimeter cannon to the 30 millimeter cannon, for that matter. You had aircraft that had very awkward installations. They would have a 20 millimeter cannon firing through the propeller, and they might have two 30 millimeter cannon under the wings, and they might have two 50 caliber 12.7 millimeter machine guns or 13 millimeter machine guns in the case of the Germans firing through the propeller, things like this. What happened when you looked at these armament combinations is they would be very effective by a f uh, if a fighter was closing on a relatively slow-moving bomber and could close to effective firing range where all three or four different kinds of weapons were bore sighted on that bomber. But they were totally ineffective in fighter versus fighter combat. They were totally ineffective because the individual firing rate of those weapons tended to be very slow, and then you did not have really a, a single unifying ballistic track to all the bullets that were being fired. And as a result, you had situations in which a fighter could be exposed to a burst of fire from an aircraft such as a Messerschmitt 109 or an FW-190 and could basically, if you will, almost fly through the bullet pattern or could evade the hits or would take one hit out of out of six weapons fired at it from this aircraft at one time. The concentrated packages of 650 caliber machine guns or 850 caliber machine guns, looking at say a P-51 versus a P-47, or 420 millimeter cannon in the case of a Spitfire or something of that sort, actually when you take a look at it, those were much more effective means of projecting power from the aircraft against an opponent. And they gave you a much higher, what we term, P sub K, probability of a kill. Training pilots to fly the P-47 was a serious affair, but often was done with a touch of humor. Here, comedian Lou Lair introduces pilots to a training film on the P-47. Golfers is the craziest people, but from golfers, you pilots can get a serious lesson, if I ain't too personal. Take this, for instance. The first rule is keep your eye on the ball. How many of you is looking at the ball? You said it. <laughs> Me neither. But in golf, there are certain things you got to do the same way every time. First, you got to get the ship Twimmed for a zoom down the runway. Cowl flaps open, landing gear resting firmly on the ground. The stick is eased well back until a stall occurs. Now full throttle. And the maneuver is completed with a normal loop. For you newcomers information, maneuver is not what you put on your victory garden to make your vegetables grow. Then comes the approach. The one that works best for me is, <clears throat> Hiya, Toots. Uh, no, pardon me. <laughs> That's a different game. I mean, to reach your objective successfully, and I know you alert pilots in the audience is now ready for tomorrow, you've got to follow an established procedure. Make the right way the only way. An established procedure is what a good golfer does as his second nature. What the professor was trying to say is that in flying the P-47, there's an established procedure to follow from the moment you approach the airplane until you turn it over to the crew chief at the end of the flight. Headquarters, 8th Air Force. General Doolittle is discussing fighter protection. The 8th Fighter Command, 
give fighter cover to targets and back from the target. It's desirable that we peel off as many fighters as possible to come down east of the Ruhr and straight ground target. The bomber plan. Timing, altitudes, strength, course, and targets reaches the combat operations room at headquarters 8th Fighter Command. Major General Kepner commanding. A field order goes out. 62nd Group P-47s will escort heavy bombers over enemy coast through target to limit of endurance. The machinery is set in motion. Now comes the briefing for the mission and everybody present. These Thunderbolt pilots are veterans of many missions, so the colonel gives them only the essentials. They are to escort the bombers to a target about 40 miles east of Mannheim and then proceed to the strafing of airdromes north of Frankfurt. The pilots make notes on the backs or palms of their left hands. Intelligence warns them that they may expect considerable enemy opposition today. The Germans have brought in some 100 single-engine fighters. On the field, planes warm up. It's takeoff time for the Thunderbolt. Other bases, timed to the escort schedule, the P-38s get underway. And at others, the long-range Mustangs go to keep their rendezvous with the bombers someplace deep in Germany. Somewhere out there, over enemy territory. Near or far, on the long route, the bombers go out and come home. Each of these formations will make rendezvous at a certain point on the exact minute. The Thunderbolts climb steadily over the channel into hostile skies, close to rendezvous. And in the distance are the bombers. Advanced formations of an armada perhaps a hundred miles long. The Thunderbolts maneuver for their escort position. Each pilot searches the sky, constantly watching for the main enemy attack, which may come near the coast or deep in Germany, or hit and run sneak attacks by the enemy's aerial snipers. And then, at another rendezvous point, comes a group of Mustangs to relieve the Thunderbolts. The Mustangs, far in the distance, sweep the surrounding sky as they get ready to come in to take the places held by the Thunderbolts. One of the most important features of long-range fighter escort is this relay system. Because of the differences in bomber speeds and the need of much weaving, fighters used up their gas. Thus, the same group of fighters could remain with the bombers only 25 to 40 minutes out of a six or eight hour mission going and coming. And a thousand fighters might be needed to keep anything from 40 to 100 on the job at all times, while the enemy could strike with 250 planes at any point he selected. The Luftwaffe was forewarned an hour and a half in advance, even as the bombers gained altitude over England. This captured German film shows how quickly their ME-109s and Focke-Wulf 190s got into action after a warning. They have plenty of time to amass their fighters at a chosen point of attack and to outnumber the Allied escort at anything from 2 to 1 to 10 to 1. And 
then the engagement. P-47s protecting their bombers. lose planes, but the bombers can't be stopped. The Thunderbolts, often heavily outnumbered, engage the enemy all over the sky. And this battle was only one of many. Day after day, month after month, they went up against the Messerschmitt 109s and the FW 190. These fighters knew one strategy. Attack, attack, attack. Two into 10, six into 50. They blocked the enemy's mass assaults until the Allied victory column soared at the rate of four to one. If a missed rendezvous or other misadventure due usually to blinding weather prevented fighter protection somewhere, the bombers suffered heavy losses but no American fighter ever failed them because of enemy odds, however great. Germany was not the only place where the P-47 was creating mayhem for the Axis. Perhaps no campaign was a greater triumph for the Thunderbolt than Italy in 1944. The P-47 changed the map of Italy from the air. It was said that Italian trains ran on time. Not these. This is what the Thunderbolt did to the face of Italy. Think back to what it must have been like to fly these magnificent warbirds over war-torn Italy. Imagine that you are there. Alto Air Base, Sunday morning. Here, Sunday is like Monday. And Monday is like every other day in the week, a working day. The engines wake everyone at dawn. In their beds, the pilots can hear the crew chiefs already at work, pre-flighting the planes, getting them ready for the day's mission. This is how the Air Force is when you're an Allied pilot, fighting an air war, 20 minutes from the Germans in Italy. They get used to it. They've been washing out of their helmets since July 42. From the Holy Land to Africa across the desert. Egypt to El Alamein to Libya and Tunisia. 1,300 miles. The pilots moved when the infantry moved. Sicily and Italy. 58 moves in two years. Now, Corsica. These are the best conditions they ever had. Sunday morning. For the 57th fighter group, three squadrons, a thousand men. Another day begins at Alto Air Base. Home sweet home for this air crew and has been for some time. Good steel mat runway, 150 by 6,000 feet. Tower call sign is breakneck. Lots of jokes about that. They share the field with a French fighter group. They don't speak the same language, but they fly the same airplane against the same enemy. Each lost a man yesterday. Each pilot has an escape kit that includes enemy money and instructions on how to get you back through the line just in case. The commander tells them about their target. He doesn't have to go into great detail. They do this every day, sometimes two or three times a day. The commanders upstairs plan the war. When they want something done, they pick up the phone. And the pilots do it. They don't always know why they are sent out on a mission. They don't always care. But they know there's a reason, a good one. Today, the missions are going out 
because in Italy the Allied armies have been stopped in their tracks at the Gustav line across the narrowest and most mountainous part of the peninsula. The U.S. 5th Army and the British 8th Army stopped for five miles. At Anzio, a hundred thousand men were sweating it out. They couldn't move. Stalemated. The Allies started to use a special weapon, a fighter bomber, the P-47 Thunderbolt. One engine, one man, one bomb on each wing. Extra fuel tanks for range. This was the job they set out to do. The crew chiefs taxi the plane from dispersal points. At the end of the runway, the squadrons line up and all the pilots have to do is climb in and take them away. If you're a crew chief, you've got your own P-47. Sometimes you think of it as your personal airplane. The pilots are who they lend it to every day. They let him fly around in it, and they expect him to bring it back in good condition. No bullet holes or flak holes. After they've been lending the airplane to one pilot for a long time, they might get attached to him too. If you're a pilot, no matter what your rank or how many hours you've had, what counts here is the combat flying you've done. Unless you've done plenty, you're considered a beginner. And you remain a beginner until you learn the tricks of the trade. After you put a few missions behind you, you become a sport. Then, with plenty of action, 50 or 60 missions, if you're still around, you're promoted. You become an old sport, a veteran. The crew chief can't go along, so they always like to tell him what they're going to do. Got a triple threat mission today. Each section's going after a bridge. They are to come in on a course of about 40 degrees. Same old thing. Go out there and dodge around in the ack ack. Dive bomb out of a left hand turnabout and carry the bombs right on down. This pilot is to fly top cover on the other two sections while they bomb and then go in afterwards. Weather's supposed to be good, so maybe they will have a good show. All set to go, but they wait. They wait for five minutes. That's the way it's planned. Time to settle down relax. They'll be busy later. So if they've got any thinking to do, and who hasn't, now's the time to do it. The Thunderbolt's a heavy airplane. Besides, it's loaded up like a Christmas tree. Belly tank, rockets, guns, 500-pound bombs, cameras, the mile of steel runway would shrink to nothing under the fighter. Halfway down, by the tower, they are committed. That means they can't slam on the brakes and stop. Once they're committed, they usually go up.
the squadron is airborne. Over Corsica, then out to sea. On the deck. 60 miles east to Italy. Flying from Corsica to go only 60 miles puts them 150 miles behind the German front. spread out. There's a checkpoint, that road. Follow it down to the river. The first bridge should be down there, somewhere. There it is, pass over come back and attack from the opposite direction. One of the tricks they've learned. Leader section goes into loose string formation, one plane behind the other. Last man goes in. No bomb sight for the P-47. Pilot does his own aiming. Bomb bursts. Couple of misses. Direct hit. Hope their aim is good. Drop your bombs. Pull out. They black out for a second. Blood drains from the head. They are young so it comes back fast. They're all right now. Leader section reforms. Top cover. Watch the red section bomb. A miss. Another miss. A hit. Black section goes down. Straddle the target. Percussion should do the trick. No more bombs. Back at Alto, no one is able to worry about the squadron that is in the field. The next squadron is taking off. No one will have time to worry about them either. They've gone on too many missions. This is their ninth mission today. When they don't fly, they have plenty of things to do. They try to make some sort of life for themselves. In trying, they improvised an American community. Step off a field, they are in Corsica. Step back on, you're back in America. 6-6 six, six squadron heading out. 6-5 squadron heading home. 
a meeting in the air comes and goes fast. 6-5 leader section. One plane light. When they reform after strafing, they noticed it. Nobody saw it happen. Maybe he spun in. Maybe he bailed out. They will have to think about it later. Now, they are waiting for that first sight of home base. They are very close now. Alto, first turn to the left, three fields down. Keep the formation tight. When they fly over those other fields, they want to look good. Show them how it's done. Alto. Home. They come in low and peel up. They peel up to reduce speed. Pace the plane 20 seconds apart for landing. Second and third flights go on past the field. They'll circle back when the first flight is down. Drop your gear. Second flight heals up. Third flight will circle again. This is all the flying the ground crew sees. The pilots like to give them a show. Sometimes they're tired and hit the ground hard. They're not happy about the flak holes. New airplane, the crew chief can be mighty sore. Then, after the interrogation, they relax. Grab some donuts and coffee. Talk with the Red Cross girl who meets every mission. And fly the show all over again on the ground. These pilots averaged eight and nine missions a day the French flew about as many. It was good to look up and watch them go by. But there were other things. There were those pillars of smoke. The pilots never knew when they would see one. That's a wreck. A P-47's a fire. There's a man in it. When they hit like this, there's nothing one can do but let them burn and stay clear of the exploding ammo. Keep on landing. They have to. There's nowhere else to go. How did it happen? Engine cut out for a second. 200 yards from the runway. 200 yards from home. Black damage might have caused it. They'll never know for sure. All they know is that war is hell and young men die. They kept up the pressure. And by the beginning of May, the roads were practically closed. If one man on a motorcycle appeared on the highway by day, he was a dead man. The Germans took to the sea. Two months after they started, the Allies had a stranglehold on all of Italy. The Germans had barely enough supplies for two weeks. That's when the ground forces attacked. Allied troops took Casino. The warbirds linked up with a beachhead at Anzio. 
and in three weeks, they were all in Rome. they moved up, they saw what had been done to help them. 10,000 enemy vehicles destroyed or damaged. In every town they took, no marshalling yard. How many German tanks went out of business because of the gasoline these trains never carried? They advanced and they saw the bridges. How many German shells were never fired because they couldn't get across the river? The ground forces exploited their breakthrough and moved quickly throughout the country. Almost 250 miles in one non-stop offensive. The ground forces won a battle, but they still had a war to fight. And the Thunderbolts were still flying missions, up from first light to last light. Only the coming of darkness could stop them. Only the coming of darkness would bring the last mission to an end. until tomorrow. These war birds of World War II never gave up. They blasted from the sky to wreak havoc on Axis planes and materiel. One of the finest fighter airplanes in history, the P-47s and the pilots that flew them were destined for greatness. And today, more than 50 years after the war ended, their exploits are still a marvel to behold.